So I'm trying to work out what's scarier, awkward teen romance, bloodthirsty demogorgons, or Winona Ryder. The introduction of Stranger Things in 2016 presented us with something that was derivative, yet fresh. It was very confusing. Stranger Things Season 2 was more of the same, but dragged in places before coming to a huge climax. The show succeeded in capturing something a lot of us had missed from our childhood, and it was shameless in directing nods towards many influences from that era. That's what made it so good. It's been well over a year and a half since we binged the second season, and since then, many pop culture commentators and critics have heralded the end of the 80s nostalgia trend. And they are wrong. According to the Netflix US Twitter account, in less than a week since Stranger Things Season 3 launched on July 4, over 40 million household accounts have viewed the series, and just over 18 million had already finished the entire season. Now, there's a lot of problems with Stranger Things Season 3, but it is still a lot of fun, and it's abundantly clear that people still have a huge appetite for the Upside Down. And now... Stay. It's not opened without a smidgen of controversy either. The anti-tobacco use group Truth Initiative released a study about on-screen tobacco usage and called Stranger Things out, revealing that every single episode included tobacco consumption. Netflix replied by saying that they recognised that smoking was harmful, and from now on all projects with ratings of PG-13 and below will be tobacco-free, except for reasons of historical or factual accuracy. For programs with higher ratings, it won't happen unless it's essential to the creative vision of the artist or character-defining, along with the other crap about facts and history. So what does that mean? Probably nothing. For Stranger Things. While cigarette cameos might be the last and only means for big tobacco to push their products, I wouldn't say that the portrayal of smoking is in any way appealing. There's a scene, for example, where Hopper lights up in the middle of a crowded restaurant, and in this day and age, that's just quite shocking, and it's gross as well, but it most definitely is historically accurate. People smoked everywhere in the 80s restaurants, planes, shopping centres, you name it, it was nothing to see a couple of parents munching durries in the car with all the windows up and a couple of kids who didn't have a choice in the back hurtling down the freeway, taking valuable years off their lives. We've come a long way since then, so please spare us the nanny state bullshit. <laughs> David, you, you had to smoke so much on that on the show. Well, I mean, I'm not referencing I love it so much. But, but like, I, I don't understand how like you two not pass out. I could not... Do that. I needed a cigarette between every take too. No. Set in 1985, in the real world, the Duffer Brothers would be celebrating their first birthday, the show picks up one year after the events of season two. The new Starcourt Mall is the place to be in Hawkins, Indiana. Ahoy. 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 Starcourt Mall is one of the finest shopping facilities in America and beyond. So come on down. Eleven and Mike have become an item and their teenage romance is blossoming, much to Sheriff Hopper's dismay. Little Will is now taller than his mother and has developed some sixth sense for bad stuff from the Upside Down. Dustin is back from summer science camp, still as annoying as ever. Lucas still seems to be the voice of reason among the boys. Billy, the lifeguard at the local pool, is the object of all the ladies' affection. Nancy is working for a bunch of misogynists at the local newspaper and gets a hot tip about a strange event involving rodents. Something is stirring at the steel mill and the boys pick up a mysterious Russian transmission. And away we go. All your favourites are back. Most of them have gone through significant growth spurts since Season 2 and are now in that awkward pubescent phase, particularly Finn Wolfhard who plays Mike. Newcomers to the cast include Jake Busey as Bruce and Carrie Ulls as Mayor Larry Klein. Standout performers include Winona Ryder as Joyce, although it is hard to tell if she's acting or just batshit crazy these days, Dacry Montgomery as the bad boy Billy Hargrove, Brett Gelman as Murray Bauman, Priya Ferguson as Lucas's little sister Erica, Maya Hawke 
daughter of Ethan and Uma Thurman as Robin. And once again, David Harbour absolutely steals the show as Sheriff Hopper. Everything is bigger in Season 3. Bigger special effects, bigger action, bigger storyline. There's more neon, more synth music, and it is swollen with the excess of the mid-80s. It is ridiculous, but also a lot of fun, as they do away with a lot of the drama and focus more on action or horror comedy. You'll see homage paid to John Carpenter's The Thing, Red Dawn, Day of the Dead, The Terminator, Back to the Future, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High, to name but a few. Every episode is wall to wall with Easter eggs, which we come to expect. The soundtrack is great. The look and feel of it all comes across as really authentic, particularly the scenes around the mall. It's got jokes too, lots of them, especially the scenes with Hopper and Joyce, as well as those with Robin and Steve. Mostly, they're great fun, but some of them hang on the joke for too long at really critical times in the story, and it sucks all the tension out of the situation. There's a few scenes in there that could have been handled way more seriously, and the show definitely would have been better for it. It also suffers from inconsistent performances and truly ridiculous moments where, even though we know the story is preposterous and far-fetched, you're forced to suspend your disbelief way too much. But maybe that's the kind of excess the 80s stood for, I don't know. It's almost more fun to be yelling at your TV about the absurdity of it all sometimes. Millie Bobby Brown is a great actor, no doubt. But she seems too relaxed at times with Eleven's power. For example, she's doing all of this telekinetic shit that causes her so much mental strain, it makes her freaking nosebleed. And she seems to be wielding that power with her hands, but she's just holding her arms out at times like she's playing the mummy in a school play. Hey! No running on my watch! I gotta warn you again and you're banned for life. You wanna be banned for life? Didn't think so. Criticism aside, if you've liked the story so far, you'll love this and you'll likely forgive any misgivings. They've picked up the pace from season two and it looks like they're going to charge into a fourth and hopefully final season because it'd be nice to wrap it all up nice and tidy. Stranger Things season three is a lot like puberty. Awkwardly out of proportion, it gets hairy in weird places and the humor comes too quickly and at really odd times. But when it's all over, you'll look back on it as a great time. Three and a half out of five. No matter what happens, we have to stop him. Together. Now it's time. Drop me a like, hit subscribe, please tell me what you think, and for more straight shooting reviews, head on over to thewatchman.com.au.